was almost dawn. Aircraft engines sputtered, then roared. Aviators climbed into cockpits. Six aircraft carriers turned into a stiff wind. In 20 minutes, 183 planes thundered off the decks and into the darkness. It was 6.15 a.m. December 7, 1941. The first wave of the Japanese attack had its sun. Fifty minutes later, the second wave, 167 more planes, jumped skyward into the morning light. The attack force was on the brink of achieving the improbable. Surprise. The idea came from Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto. War between Japan and the United States seemed inevitable. Japan had little chance of winning, unless the U.S. fleet in Hawaii could be destroyed. For a year, Yamamoto and his staff worked on a secret plan. Knock out the fleet, cripple American air power, conquer the Southwest Pacific before the U.S. could recover. A huge task force had to sail undiscovered in radio silence for over 4,000 miles. Twelve days. Aircraft carriers would send out two waves of planes to strike in tandem with five midget submarines launched from large submarines stationed south of Oahu. It was a bold gamble. Oahu was the home of the American fleet, the strategic hub of the entire Pacific. The island was rich in targets, but the attack faced the formidable air power of Oahu's six airfields. Yet 350 planes now soared toward the island. So far, no one had come to stop them. It was a quiet Sunday morning at Pearl Harbor, but there were signs. Warnings had come from Washington. War with Japan was imminent. Many expected a Japanese attack, but not here, not on Oahu. Early that morning, the American destroyer Ward spotted a partially submerged craft outside the harbor. It was one of the midget submarines. The Ward fired twice. Then, upon passing, dropped a barrage of four depth charges. A few minutes later, 7.02 a.m., two privates at the Opana radar station saw a bright spike rise on the screen. The sighting was the biggest that they had ever seen. But a lieutenant told them not to worry. Some B-17 bombers were doing from the U.S. mainland. That was probably all it was. Not far away, Commander Mitsuo Fuchida, leading the first wave of 183 planes, knew he was close to Oahu, but clouds blocked his view. Then suddenly, there it was. Blue water, white surf, an island like a green jewel. Minutes later, Fuchida spotted it through his binoculars, over 185 vessels, a row of battleships tethered in pairs. It was 7.53. Fuchida's radio man transmitted a coded telegraph message. Tora, Tora, Tora. It meant complete surprise achieved. Air bases first. The Japanese plan was meticulous and systematic. Crush American air power before it can get off the ground. Strike the American fighter planes first to gain control of the air. Then hit the long-range patrol planes and bombers so the Japanese task force at sea could not be located and attacked. Dive bombers came screaming down to bomb and then strafe. Then fighter planes, machine guns and cannons blazing. Neat rows of American planes burst into flame. The attack struck air bases at Wheeler Field. Then Kaneohe Bay. Pearl Harbor. Hickam Field, Eva, and later Bellows. The placid Sunday was a sudden inferno. At 7.58, a radio operator at Pearl Harbor flashed out the message in plain English. Air raid, Pearl Harbor, this is no drill. Too late, the Japanese had command of the air. In 15 devastating minutes, they'd crippled American air power in Hawaii. Just before 8 o'clock, 16 torpedo bombers dipped down and spread out, flying less than 50 feet above the water. 
The ships below prepared for morning colors. Military bands prepared to play the Star Spangled Banner. A sailor looked up and wondered why the army was holding a drill on a Sunday. But it was no drill. Torpedoes dropped into the water at close range and churned toward the ships. The U.S. Navy believed the harbor was too shallow for torpedoes, but not for these. The Japanese had made torpedoes that could be launched in 40 feet of water. On ship after ship, a roar below decks, a lurch, a huge water geyser 600 feet into the air, then a choking cloud of vapor, oil, and smoke. Torpedoes ripped holes below. The battleships West Virginia and Oklahoma each took nine in the gut. Two more blasted California, another struck Nevada. Oklahoma listed sharply. Water rose, emergency lights went out. Men trapped below cried out in darkness. Above them, more torpedoes slammed home. But half the American battleships seemed safe. Those on the inside of the moored pairs and the thick armor plating on their decks would surely protect them from above. But Fujita's high-level bombers each carried a single bomb, especially modified to pierce that armor. At six minutes past eight, it happened. A bomb crashed through Arizona's deck and penetrated the forward magazine. The magazine exploded. The ship ripped apart. A ball of fire and smoke rose over 500 feet in the air. The harbor was filled with scenes from hell. Men dove from blazing ships and swam to Ford Island, soaked with oil, their bodies burned, shocked. The first wave had succeeded. By 8.30, the planes headed back toward their carriers. Mitsuo Fuchida was satisfied. In 20 minutes, his attackers had crippled the striking power of the Pacific Fleet. He'd lost in return nine planes. For nearly a half hour, the skies over Oahu were empty. Was it over? Not yet. Just before nine o'clock, the second wave of Japanese planes filled the air. But again, the fighters and bombers raked airfields and air stations. Bombs exploded on the ships at Pearl Harbor. The objective of the second wave was to finish off any battleships and to destroy any American aircraft that might retaliate against the Japanese fleet at sea. In the first wave, there had been little time to fight back. But this time, despite their losses, the Americans were ready. Machine guns chattered from the ground. Anti-aircraft fire popped the sky. A few American pilots got fighter planes into the air. The dogfights began. 20 attacking planes fell from the sky. The battleship Nevada tried to escape by sailing to sea. 23 dive bombers swarmed to attack her. After five direct hits, the badly damaged ship was purposefully run aground to keep the entrance channel to the harbor clear. Fires ignited by a direct hit on the destroyer Shaw detonated the forward magazine, ripping her bow completely off. Finally, the planes wheeled and flew away. It was almost 10 a.m. After two short and very long hours, it was over. 21 American vessels were sunk or seriously damaged. 188 planes destroyed. By nightfall, 1,158 Americans were wounded and 2,390 people were dead. 49 civilians, too, died that day, most from friendly fire. The Japanese lost just 29 planes, five midget submarines, and 64 men. Their improbable surprise had worked with one hitch. No American aircraft carriers had been in port. Pearl Harbor was not a knockout blow, but the bold Japanese attack had changed warfare forever. Naval air power, not battleships, would dominate the conflict to come. The next day, 
President Franklin D. Roosevelt addressed Congress. December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. As he spoke, the Arizona still burned. Desperate rescue workers still struggle to cut through to crew members trapped in the capsized Oklahoma. The last survivor was pulled out that same afternoon. 500 miles away, the Japanese task force was steaming home through a heavy mist. The crews were strangely quiet. The Pacific War had begun.